they thought he was God. And they were wrong. The women had followed Jesus for years. These were not foolish women. They were actually relatively wealthy. They knew how to spend their wealth. They knew how to take care of other people. They had seen people come and go. If you know your history, there were fake messiahs all the time in Israel. There had been one not long before Jesus was on the scene. And then they met Jesus. And they saw him do things that they'd never seen before. He could heal with a touch. And his enemies hated it. They wanted to call him a charlatan, and they couldn't. In fact, if you look at the ancient records, not one person says, oh yeah, Jesus didn't do that. They saw him raise the dead. But as good as those miracles were, that's not why they followed him. He had a message that they'd never heard before. If you're here with us in January and February, the message should be familiar because that's what we focused on for those months. In Jesus' early ministry, his focus was the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus' message was all those promises God's been making for a thousand years, they are about to all come true. The kingdom of God is near. God is near you, and your reaction should be to repent. Not to say, oh good, God is here, he's going to see and give me all my rewards, because you don't deserve it. No, no, you can't armor yourself with good things you've done, because God's justice will cut through all that. Don't ex surround yourself with excuses and say, well, I was poor, or I didn't know better. Don't surround yourself with blame. Well, you know, if I had grown up different, God, really, this is your fault. It's not going to work. Repent. Admit your evil and believe the good news. The good news that God is taking care of it. That as real as your sin is, God's forgiveness is just as real. And these women who knew what sin was, they had been sinned against so often, and they knew their own sin. They could not fathom mercy like that. It blew them away, and they said, this is, the, this is, this is different. This Jesus is God. And then the trial began. If you've been with us through the end of February into March, you have seen God on trial. That Jesus was arrested and accused. And the courts found him guilty. And not just worthy of a fine, but worthy of death. And not just even any death. Not a painless death, but death on a cross. And not a private death where you could die with dignity, but on the interstate. Where people could stop and see and mock. Jesus' closest followers, the apostles, they all ran away when Jesus was arrested. They could not handle being with him. Peter was a little bit braver. He actually went to the, to the courtroom. He saw the trial. But as he was sitting in the gallery, someone sitting next to him went, hey, aren't you with the guy that's accused? And Peter denied even knowing Jesus, and Jesus actually heard it. And Peter felt such guilt, he went out and he just started sobbing. He was bawling because this guilt was so heavy on him. And so it was the women that were there watching the person they thought was God die. They saw him as all his weight hung on three spikes that went through ankle and wrist. They heard him cry out his last breath. They witnessed as two followers, not even his chosen apostles, but two other followers, volunteered to take Jesus down from the cross, pry the spikes from his flesh, wrap him in a cloth that had once been white and then quickly turn crimson. They followed to see him as he was put in a tomb, a new cave that had just been cut from the rock. 
and they heard the stone as it rumbled, as it was rolled in front of the tomb. And that wasn't to keep Jesus in the tomb. They didn't believe in zombies back then, sorry. It was actually there to keep wild animals out so that no one could desecrate the body. They wept, and they went home. They were wrong. They longed to show love to their, to their Lord one last time. It was very normal back then to take care of a body. You didn't just throw a body into a grave. Just like today, when someone dies, they go to the funeral home, and the funeral home takes care of the body. Well, unlike today, they did not have refrigeration back then, so you'd have to take care of the body immediately, especially in that climate. But Jesus died late enough in the day that they couldn't take care of him that day. And the next day, Saturday, was a holy day. No one was allowed to touch any dead body. So they were forced to wait till Sunday. Now, as a pastor, I have held the hands of the dying. I have closed the eyes of those who had no one else to close their eyes. But I've learned something. That to voluntarily touch a dead body is to love a person. I have seen wives kiss their dead husbands' foreheads one last time as they wept. I've seen children weep on the chest of their mother after mom is gone. That, that to touch a dead person, that you love them. You don't do that unless you love them. Imagine the level of love these women are showing. This is not some nice, clean hospice where the nurse brings you a bereavement kit. This is not a clean hospital. This is a cave where a body has been rotting for three days and that body was not in good condition when it went in there. They loved him so much. Well, as they're walking, they're talking to each other. Wait a second. We usually take care of the body right away. But he's in a tomb already, and it's sealed up. Who's going to open it up for us? They, they didn't have to deal with that normally. They, they weren't ditzes. They just hadn't thought of this ahead of time. Who's going to open up the tomb? And they get to the tomb, and the stone is open. And their reaction is not, wow, this is convenient. Their reaction is fear. Can you imagine someone you love has been buried, and you're going to the gravesite, and you show up, and someone has dug up the casket? Your reaction is not, oh, good. Your action is probably anger, bewilderment. What is going on? Someone has opened up the tomb. Has someone purposely done this? Jesus had so many enemies. Did someone open it on purpose to desecrate the body, to show him hate even now? Salome takes a step forward. She's, she's scared. Mary takes a step backwards. She isn't sure what to do. The other Mary, she finally rushes in. The other two follow. And then they go, oh! You ever turn a corner and you're not expecting someone to be there and there's someone there and you just get startled? They go into the tomb and there's someone in the tomb. It's someone they don't know. It's a young man. We know from Jesus' other biographies in the Bible, this is an angel. And the angel looks at them and says, don't be alarmed. Thanks. Get my heart back under control, right? Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus. You're looking for the Jesus that was from the city of Nazareth. Yeah, the one that was crucified. I love that he does all that in there. It's not like you're looking for Jesus Jones. Oh, yeah, that's two tombs over. No, he's very specific. This is Jesus, the one from the city of Nazareth. This is the one that was crucified. That's the guy you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, he's not here. He's risen. Go. Tell his disciples and Peter they're going to see him again. Just like he told them. Little reminder that Jesus had actually been very upfront about what would happen. And the last verse that you heard 
especially if you grow up in church, might be really weird. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Why is that their reaction? They thought that Jesus was God. They thought they were wrong. He died, and now he's alive again. You'd think that would be happiness. But grief doesn't work that way. I mean, can you imagine going to a funeral of a loved one and then the, the pastor or the officiant showing up and saying, oh, yeah, yeah, they're alive. They got better. Your reaction would not be joy. Your reaction would be something is messed up here. <laughs> because you live in the real world. Dead people don't get up and walk around. Except this time it happened. This time it's real. This is one of those things that history just scratches its head when you look at it. We've got these four biographical accounts of Jesus, and they all agree. He rose from the dead. Then you get the rest of the New Testament that says, yeah, he rose from the dead. If I had read more of 1 Corinthians, which we, which we heard a little bit ago, you would hear there was a list of people that saw Jesus alive. And at that point, as Paul is writing this, he goes, yeah, and most of them are still alive. You can go talk to them. They're still there. He actually says, oh, and there were 500 people that saw him alive all at the same time. Most of them were still alive at that point. Some of them had died, and he says that. There were all these witnesses. And many of them died because they said Jesus is alive. Now, if you've been here before, I say this almost every Easter because it's true. I know a lot of people that are willing to die for things that I would say are not true. You probably know that too. Just because you're willing to die for something doesn't mean that thing is true. But if I say, I saw him alive, and you can kill me, and I will still say he's alive, well, that's a pretty big clue that so they saw something, huh? Jesus appears to his disciples later that night because they're dips and they don't believe the women when the women show up and say, yeah, well, yeah, he, he's alive. He says, here I am. A week later, Thomas doesn't believe. He goes, no, people don't get up and, and walk around. That's not true. Jesus shows up and says, here I am. And Thomas falls to his knees. My God and my Lord. It's real. And that's really, really important for you. Two reasons. One, you're going to die. I'm sorry. I know that's not what you want to hear on a Sunday morning, but it's true. Scientists have not yet figured out the key to immortality. In my belief, I don't think they ever will. And if they did, I don't know if I'd want it. Can you imagine getting older and older and older and never dying? I don't know, I'm only 40 something now and I'm already not too happy with the way my body is going. You're going to die. And you need to figure out what's going to happen after. And all of you know this, that there is a judge. We try to cover it up. But there's a reason that every human on earth knows that there is something right and there is something wrong. You can talk to a person that denies that there's anything supernatural. And if you ask them, is genocide wrong? They will always say yes. Good, I'm glad you believe that. Everyone knows there's a right and a wrong. And in the end, there's a judge. And the judge is going to look at you and say, okay, let's go through your life. You're going to die. God did not have to die. At the beginning of the service, you recited a Bible verse. The, the reference wasn't on the screen, so I don't know if you caught it. The wages of sin is death. If you sin, you die. If you do something wrong, you die. When Jesus was here, he was different. He had so many enemies that tried to accuse him of things, and none of the accusations stuck. At one point, Jesus actually said, who can accuse me of being guilty of any sin? Not even, like, take me to the courthouse. Like, did you ever catch me in a little white lie? And no one could. He was the one person who deserved to live. And what Jesus said is, I know you're going to be put on trial. I'll be put on trial in your place. 
all the accusations that go against you, let them come to me instead. And I will plead guilty for you. When he died on that cross, he took all of your guilt, your shame, everything you've ever done, and nailed it to that cross. And he died instead of you. Now, if Jesus was a really special person that died, woo, maybe we'd have a day for him. And we celebrate all sorts of people that have died in the past. We've got President's Day. Maybe you, you take time to remember loved ones that have died before. You, you, remember, they, you remember the anniversary of their death. But then comes Easter. And Jesus walks out of the tomb alive. That is God looking at Jesus and saying, hey, they accused you of being guilty. I declare you not guilty. Come out of the tomb. No punishment. And Jesus walked out alive. But because he traded places with you, what happened to him is now going to happen to you. Someday you're going to die, but that will not be the end of your story. Jesus will return. And you're going to be alive again. Maybe you're lying in a tomb. Maybe your ashes are scattered over the Serengeti. I don't know what's going to happen to your body. But I know on that day that Jesus returns, he's going to put your body back together. It's going to be a miracle. He's God. He can break the rules. He can do that. And it's going to be amazing. And this body will not grow old. You're not going to feel pain anymore. And you will never again grieve for another person. Because death itself will be defeated. That's reason one, that Easter is important for you. Because you're going to die. But Easter shows what happens. But there's a second reason. I mentioned guilt. Maybe the idea of meeting God is really terrifying for you. I've been in front of judges before. And it doesn't matter if you're innocent or not. You stand in front of a judge and it is terrifying. Um, I've been a witness in a court case uh, a couple of times, and that's also terrifying. And I'm not the one on trial. It's scary. Did you notice what the angel said to the women? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Hey, Peter, I know what you did. You still belong here. Peter, I know what happened. I'm not rejecting you. Come. You belong. Some of you know John 3.16 by heart. For God so loved the world. Do you know who's in the world? <laughs> Unless one of you is a hologram coming from someplace else. Martin Luther once said that any time it says the world in the Bible, you can replace that with your name. So you can look and you can say, for God so loved Tom. For God so loved Megan. For God so loved Patty. Put your name there. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God looks at you and he says, I forgive you. Tell the disciples and put your name there. You. You belong here. Easter is so important because God says to you, not guilty. You. Not just the world. Yeah, the world too. But you. You belong. And that's why Easter is so important. Maybe you noticed I mentioned what we talked about in January and February and March. This is not a one-time thing. It continues. And there are threads that get picked up throughout. It's kind of like if you come in on just Easter, you're coming in at the season finale. You see that stuff is really important. It's really cool. But you're going to miss some of it. I want to invite you, if you're someone that's here occasionally or maybe this is your first time, come back next week. Pick up some of those threads. If this Easter stuff sounds so good, come back. Because you're going to hear more about this Jesus that cares about you. That says, you belong here. That I died for you. That I live for you right now. That you get to live forever because of what I did. Come back. 
and, and get the next episode. Because cool stuff is coming. But for now, Easter has come. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's sing our next song.